what do all these very average looking men have in common? That's right, they're all dictators. And that means they love power, they hate journalists like me, and they are, quite frankly, ridiculous. I'm on a journey to three former Soviet Union countries to find out what makes some of the world's most powerful tyrants tick and to see the good, the bad, and the completely mental about living under a dictatorship. This time, I'm off to Tajikistan. It's been ruled since 1996 by President Emamali Rahman, who's also officially known as the leader of the nation and founder of peace and national unity. Here he is doing some serious dad dancing at his son's wedding, a lavish party, despite the fact that people in Tajikistan have an average income of just 800 pounds a year. As it's a poor country, Rahman's dictatorial parades can't compete with others for their military hardware but they would give Bob the Builder a run for his money. I was up in the air, somewhere above Tajikistan, but it wasn't yet safe for me to land. So, I've never had a shave in a plane toilet before. And I don't really like shaving in general because my beard accounts for about 89% of my sexiness. But none of that matters now, because I'm on my way to Tajikistan, a place where having a beard can get you in quite a lot of trouble. I kid you not. So all of this has got to go. Sadly enough. I'd heard stories of people literally being dragged off the streets by the police for sporting the kind of facial hair I had. Shave is actually running out of the factory. No, 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 no. If you're ever going to Tajikistan, remember to charge your shaver. Oh, God. Oh, God, it's dead. This looks more suspicious. <laughs> oh, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> Doing my best to fit in, I'd arrived in Dushanbe, the capital city. Getting into these countries is hard, so we told the authorities we were making a travel program, and none of the interviewees would know it was actually a series about dictatorships, for their safety and mine. Despite the lack of cash in Tajikistan, President Rahmon clearly likes spending public money on big buildings, like his crazily bling presidential palace. He recently made a law that means he can keep the palace, and his presidential summer house even when he leaves office. So this is the square of superlatives. On the right, you have the biggest museum in Central Asia, biggest library, and soon to be the biggest national theater. But apparently to really get noticed by other dictators, what you need most of all is an absolutely massive flagpole. It stands at 165 meters, and in 2011, it knocked Azerbaijan off the top, and it now sits above places like North Korea and Turkmenistan all dictatorships. So why are all these dictators so desperate to have the biggest flagpole in the world? It doesn't take a psychoanalyst to understand why they do this. So the president can lie down here and say, look at the size of my wiener. Rahman's giant flagpole isn't the only thing that looks down on the city. His portrait hangs all over the place, watching over his citizens. And it turned out the police were watching us too. So we've been filming for a couple of hours now and we've already had our first run in with the law because Ali, the director, um, decided to film what was a very nice building that turned out to be a government building. And then we were very quickly surrounded by a lot of police and a lot of military telling us to stop and asking us for all our documents. And it just reminds you that in dictator land, um, you are being watched at all times by everybody. I'm being watched right now by a guy in the window, but I think he's just curious. But it's unsettling. Rahman keeps a close eye on his citizens, partly because he's worried about Islamic extremism. He came to power after a bloody civil war against Islamists. And just across the border is Afghanistan, a hotbed of radical Islam. Today, in Tajikistan, even a beard can cause a panic. I met up with Rustam, whose facial hair had got him in trouble with the police. When I just walked near the bazaar, 
they have stopped me and say that uh, they have an order from the ministry to shave beards. They bring me to the police department and shave my beard. But they actually just hold you down and just kind Yes, of... yes. Three of them was hold me and shaved my beard. Since it happened, Rustam's refused to keep his facial hair in check. And so far, he hasn't been forcibly shaved again. I mean, how long was you be? Oh, not so long. I mean, it's not big at all. <laughs> Why do you think they were doing this? I mean, what were they trying to achieve? Maybe they thought that they will fight radicalism. It's probably quite easy if all terrorists have beards. If you shave their beards, then you yeah, don't know yes. who they are. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like slightly counterproductive. Lots of other people were shaved along with Rustam. But in a country where opening your mouth can get you in trouble, it's impossible to say how many. I can't really imagine what I would feel like if that happened to me. What it proves is that at any point, the government decides they have an issue with you. There's nothing really you can do about it, because they own you. It isn't just the police helping to keep control of people. I'd heard about a youth group that also kept an eye out for signs of trouble. So I am just about to meet in this fine Tajikistan weather a, a man from the local youth group Avant Garde. This is a group that say to say love the president and the government here. So I'm going to meet him to find out why that is the case and to see exactly what they do. 25 year old student Asladeen founded and runs Avant Garde. But he didn't look like any of the students I knew when I was at uni. You have the most well ironed suit I've ever seen. You look very nice. Um, how come you are dressed like this? Is this what you always wear? Стиль, который мне нравится, это классическое. Я часто одеваю костюм в руки и часто хожу. Instead of spending their days playing video games in their undies, these students get their kicks in a different way. This isn't what I expected. It's like all of a load of men wearing blue t-shirts. Это наши граждане, наши продавцы, наши мы мы работаем с обычными нормальными люди, чтобы они не примыкали к таким организациям как ИГИЛ. Asli Dean told us that he has the endorsement of the government. So, when people are told to attend the lecture, they do. Although people had to be there, audience participation seemed limited. After a warm handshake with the police, we headed onto the streets. I got the sense that people were wary of Asli Dean. Not surprising, as it turns out his group have helped to imprison people that the regime doesn't like. Do you think that people here are a little bit scared of you? Because you guys do seem kind of scary. But you can get them into trouble, though, by basically telling the authorities that you suspect there may be something wrong. Is that true? Когда мне для меня будет что-то подозрительное, обязательно я буду связаться с правоохранительными органами, обязательно буду сообщать им, что есть. But what are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to check to make sure that they are doing what they're meant to be doing, or? И всегда мы им мы сказали, говорим, что и пропагандируем, что для вас лучше работать, трудиться. Это лучше для вас, чем быть террористом, чем воевать, чем убивать. I wondered whether it was just religious extremists that avant-garde kept a lookout for. Радикальные группы, которые имеют религиозного характера, есть иначе, более, можно сказать, там политического характера. И у них цель, можно сказать, только одно – дестабилизировать страну. У политических у них цель – проводить революцию. There we go, thank you. I am officially a Tajik informant. It was starting to dawn on me that I was in a full-on police state. What's really happening is that groups like Avant Garde are just helping to create this culture of informants who are making sure that nobody steps out of line and, more importantly, nobody says anything bad about the government. Away from prying ears, I wanted to find someone who could give me a more honest take on the government. But it wasn't easy. When I try and speak to people off camera, who have no involvement with politics, and I try and get them to appear in this show, they're all just terrified to do so. And it's kind of difficult for me to know whether that's a genuine fear or whether it's completely imagined. But what is certain is that everybody here is scared of something. Fuck on. 
یک پرچه خاکی مقدس وطن جایی که دقیقی میتیان دست Maybe one of the country's biggest rap stars would be man enough to tell it like it is. How are you? I've met up with a man who calls himself Baron. Baron is a Kalima Tsigani, a Karachi, and a Tojiki man, a Mazmunush, a Vojd, a Vajak. I'm a Vasnal nomin, I'm a Chizefora Mechonu. But it turns out his rap isn't quite what I was used to. In the video for Motherland, one of his best-known tracks, Baron is woken by a presidential appeal to young people to love their country. A lot of what you rap about seems to be about like the kind of awesomeness of the government, the awesomeness of the leader. What exactly makes them so awesome? Me but ki Tajikistan am khel Tajikistan shi. A daulat hoy moda mu me khoyam ki amura nisham tem ki ami mu ra abot kadai mu minat dorim. Baroyam ka moda game za padlo nestai khondam baroyam marda. Bio baro darjon mu dorim presidenti khub mu. دو درجان کم کم میرن با کلوب خرسندی بسیار میکنیم فقط در کروگ اویلا برای که ما بهترین داریم پشوای ملت پشوای ملت ما امومالی رحمان پشوای ملت ما نه پشوا در تاجی کستان براد مرا میگن با بای بران همه کسا باشه نیکی بین تاجی کستان یس دا ویز جنیونلی امیزنگ You're clearly a really positive dude um, with really good rap skills. But what if one day you're not so positive and you want to say more negative things? Would you do that about the country? Critical, was mean, machida critical, was mean, knum. But granite say, gaf fora taki, chhe bugum. Amu khati kashi dagi, khedad na me bro. Misol na me fora taki, khedad da problem. Misol khedad da problem. Ana me kni khuna gyo tunda problem. Ana me kni. Fair point. In a country that's well on its way to being a dictator's dream of everyone snooping on each other, why wrap yourself into prison? And besides, when people do say things they shouldn't, the government is happy to shut them up. Twitter is blocked, Facebook is also blocked. All the social media sites are blocked, actually. And of course, anything that makes the president look a bit silly has to go. When this video of President Rahman getting stuck into his son's wedding with some fancy footwork and a little karaoke went viral, he did what any self-respecting dictator would do. He shut down YouTube. Weddings are a touchy subject in Tajikistan. Even when you're getting married, the big boss can stick his nose in. I've come to the outskirts of Dushanbe in my finest threads because I've been invited to a Tajik wedding. Oh, is this the bride? Uh, very nice to meet you. <laughs> thank you for letting me come. I don't, there you go, thank you. But you, you don't do I don't do that. Yeah. I don't do that. It's only for her. Oh, sorry, okay. How do I react? Uh, Rahmat, thank you. Oh, Rahmat. Yeah. Is she excited? But she's shy. I'm joking. You're so tajik, wow. For their own safety, I told everyone at the wedding I was making a travel documentary. Are these hats? Are they hats? But I tried to get a bit too immersed into the local culture. I would like a Tajik arroz. Arroz. How do I find one? Of course, if you want. Okay. Alright, I'm getting in too deep now. Yeah, I'm getting in too deep now. Okay, it started off as a joke. Now I think she's actually taking it serious. <laughs> Thankfully, the groom arrived, taking the heat off me. He's finally here. He didn't run away. Traditional Tajik weddings used to have crowds of around 500 people, but President Rahman has put an end to that. He decided people were using weddings to show off, so now you can be fined if you have more than 150 guests.
There are even rules governing how long the wedding can last, how many cars can drive the couple around, and the food that can be served. After just a few days in Tajikistan, I'd seen how difficult it is to avoid the presence of the big boss in basically every aspect of life. And anyone who challenges him can face a brutal end. In 2014, when the leader of an opposition party in exile in Turkey was at dinner with his family, they were all poisoned, even his five-year-old son. Realizing what was happening, they fled the dinner, only for the opposition leader to be gunned down outside. It isn't certain that the government gave the order for the assassination, but what is clear is that speaking out can get you killed. Having spent my entire trip in the capital Dushanbe, I wanted to take a look at the rest of the country. 93% of Tajikistan is mountainous. A large proportion of the population live in mountain villages, cut off from the relative wealth of the capital in simple conditions that have barely changed for 100 years. It's probably the first time the BBC have rocked up. It's definitely very different from Dushanbe. Just look at that. While the president lives in his lavish palace in the capital and spends money on things like giant flagpoles, people here remain poor. The government has made some progress in reducing poverty, but a third of Tajiks still don't have enough food to eat. The good thing about living in a village like this is that you're so far away from everything that you don't really have to worry about politics. But the downside to that is you are so far away that politics doesn't really worry about you and you're completely left alone. The locals might be ignored as long as they keep out of trouble, but it's not so easy for foreign journalists to slip under the radar. The secret police had arrived in the village, looking for us. You just can't escape them. The fact that he's come here, which is quite far away, shows that they're always watching. They always know where you are when you're in Tajikistan. Having taken our details, the police didn't stick around, but their visit gave a clear indication of how easy it would be to put a foot wrong here. So after being here for one whole week, it's safe to say that this is probably not a society I would want to live in. It's a very unusual system for me. People cannot really be who they want to be and there's no real free speech. But it's also a place that has a lot of issues that Britain just doesn't have. It has major problems with Islamic extremism coming in from Afghanistan. It has real problems with poverty. And it also was in a civil war just 20 years ago. Some say Rahman is just bringing the stability this country needs. But observers say Tajikistan is in the midst of a serious human rights crisis. Either way, He's going nowhere anytime soon. <laughs>